Okay, greetings to the gentlemen of CBC, to the community of CBC, and a special greeting to the wider Edmund Rice Beyond Borders community who join us today with our little cooking segment. So, boys, one of the joys I've had over the last two years is when we did this during the COVID lockdown, a number of you actually um, tried it, uh, you, you met the challenge, you tried it, and it, I'm happy to say many of you have since made this a staple part of your family's diet, and that fills me with joy, because cooking should be um, a pleasure, cooking should be art, and cooking is something that you can keep experimenting with for the rest of your life. And when I go and visit countries all over the world, one of the first things that I'm really, really interested in is their cuisine. So a little bit about today's dish. This dish has its origin in southwestern Sicily. In fact, you could probably throw um, a, a blanket over the number of towns who actually produce this particular dish. It's called mbuliata, okay? And it's got various spellings, sometimes mbuliata, sometimes mbuliata. And the thing about it is it's actually written in Sicilian and the Sicilian dialect is uh, very esoteric. It's very unusual, okay? If a Sicilian speaks um, their dialect in other parts of Italy, they probably won't be understood. And one of the successes of the mafia, especially in the United States, is that um, when they hear them on the telephone, um, they couldn't understand a word they were speaking because Sicilian is a very, very idiosyncratic language. Having said that, it's my mother tongue. It's the first, it's the first words I uttered were Sicilian. So, Moriade Siciliane are what I'm going to be showing you to make today. So, the ingredients. First of all, you're going to need some type 00 flour. Okay, 00 is what's used for the best bread, pasta, pizza and focaccia. Um, I use il molino, but there are lots of different types of zero zero flour. And then you need some yeast. I tend to use dry yeast, but you, you can use any kind of yeast. If you've got your own recipe for dough, then forget mine, but, but um, today I'll give you my recipe. And then very simple after that, some Italian sausage, but meat, whatever meat you like. Um, this, is, this is, I think, beef with a bit of pork and some fennel and pepper. Um, but, but if there's a particular sausage meat that you like, you can use that. And then some Kalamata olives, some rock salt, some pepper, and the best oil you can get. Okay, never skimp on oil. This one here is Cobram, Cobram Estate, extra virgin um, olive oil. Make sure you get really good olive oil. As I said in my last uh, little cooking presentation, Olive oil is like the elixir for, for cooking, and it's, if it's got that real nutty and, and deep colour and it's heavy, um, the, I think um, the, the thicker it is, the better it is. So without further ado, I'm going to be joined today by a special guest. Hi, I'm Harry Sloan. I'm in Year 9 here at CBC, and I'll be trying to help Mr Berger today. You will be helping me because if you watch, you'll be learning, and I'm sure, Harry, you'll be a master at this, as will... Um, all our viewers if they put their mind to it because it is fairly simple if you have the discipline. Now we have thoroughly washed our hands as per um, COVID um, uh, protocols at the moment, but just to make sure, put a little bit more hand sanitizer. Right, so the base today is to make a dough. I suggest you make the dough probably four to six hours before you're ready to cook. So this is my recipe for dough. The recipe is in cups. So two cups of flour for every tablespoon of yeast is what I use. And then I add a little bit of salt, less than more, because as I'm going to tell you, the two enemies of yeast are too much salt and the water too hot. So your water's got to be um, lukewarm and salt a little bit less than more. You can always add salt later on. So here we go. I'm going to make two lots. So one cup, two cups, three cups, Four cups. 
and then one, two, that's plenty, right, and then give that a bit of a dry mix, okay, and then gradually add your water, you don't, if you, if you kill it with water you then got to keep adding um, flour and then your mixture ratios go all out of whack, so just get it a bit wet like that, the more you fold your dough the fluffier it'll be, so um, you know, any time that you invest in kneading your dough will come back to you uh, with, a, with a lovely fluff, fluffy base. So I always add a little bit of oil. When I say a little bit, an Italian's little bit is quite a lot. And you're gonna see, we're actually gonna smother this dish. Now this dish has its genesis, as I said, in southwestern Sicily. And um, it would be used in two, for two reasons. First of all, in Sicily, because it was a very agrarian economy, and because it was an economy where the towns, everyone lived in the town, and then they worked out and, and uh, they, they went out every morning, very early in the morning. I can still remember 1972, it was almost still feudal, our, our um, hometown. And every morning, uh, the mule, the farmer, probably a goat, uh, would go to the local watering fountain, um, get their water for the day, get water for the, for the animals, and then they'd go out. And sometimes they'd go out for it'd be a three or four hour ride, okay? And sometimes it would be so far, they would stay there four or five days. So what the, um, the dedicated wives would do, and back then it was a very patriarchal society, but what they would do is they would load up their husband's saddlebags with these muliate, very rich in carbohydrates, okay? And because they're so moist, unlike bread because of all the olive oil, they'll last a week and still be fresh. So that's where this particular dish started. So you can still see my dough's still pretty dry, so I add a bit more water. And you know when your dough's right, it's quite elastic. All right, probably needs a bit more down the sides. That's looking really good. Make sure you get it right off the sides right off the bottom, there are no dry bits. Okay, so that's looking really good. And you can see, also, pretty elastic. I'm gonna make sure I go and wash that finger because some of the others are gonna eat this today and we don't want any uh, cross-contamination or the World Health Organization ringing up and saying they've broken some health pro protocol. But basically, that's ready to rest now. I'd put that somewhere dark Cover it, try and cover it with something that's a, a little bit rounder because as this rises, so, the mistake I've made sometimes if I'll take, I'll cover it with a tablecloth and then it'll it rise so much it sticks to the bottom of the tablecloth. So, so a dish, another dish is fine, but generally in a cupboard so that it's dark and hopefully that'll rise. Okay, so we'll just put that to bed and we'll be back in a few hours. Here's one I made a little earlier. So, just put a tiny bit of flour on there, and then obviously on our workbench. Okay, beautiful. Right. I've seen uh, some people end up with a square metre of dough, and other people make these individually. Right, so what we'll do, I'm going to cut this one in half. Okay. We'll do it in two lots. So the first one. I'm going to roll it out as thinly as possible. Okay, that's looking great. Next bit, 
smother it in olive oil. Now just about everyone in the southwest of Sicily lives to 100 years old. And I reckon it's because of the amount of olive oil they, um, they eat. So. All the way to the edges if you can. Now we're ready to add, the word in Sicilian is capoliato. Um, sounds terrible, but basically it's, it's a filling. So what I do is I get some of these Italian sausages. These are in the skin, so I just sque squeeze the skin a bit and out comes a little um, dob of sausage meat. And in no particular order, I'll place those all the way through until it covers all of this sheet. And then, can you just open the calamatas for us? Good boy. Now these are calamata olives. Technically they're pitted, but I've put too many stories on my dentist's house to know that pitted calamatas aren't necessarily completely pitted. So I always grab them, squeeze them at either end, Okay, so I've actually felt whether there's any pit, because sometimes, although they're pitted, there's a little bit of pit st still in, in there. And if you're biting into one of these, and you're thinking that, um, that it's all soft, and you hit a pit, uh, you're gonna put in a, be putting another floor on your dentist's house. So, in a minute, I'm gonna hand over to Harry, and Harry's gonna do this all the way through. So Harry, all yours, mate. Yep. Some people put uh, potato in there, some people put uh, onion in there. I've never tasted um, uh, bulliate with either uh, potato or onion, so I keep them nice and simple. For the vegetarians, they taste just as good without the sausage meat, so my daughter's a vegetarian, so with the second lot there, I'll make one exactly the same, but without the meat. Perfect, mate. Good boy, you sure you haven't got a bit of Sicilian in you? Oh, I'm pretty sure, but yeah. we never know, yeah. way back. This sausage is actually from Frank's Gourmet Deli, which is in Ray Avenue, Fremantle. Frank makes fantastic Italian sausage, as well as a million other varieties of sausage, but his Italian sausage is to die for. So, um, thank you for supplying the sausage today. He's always very generous with our college. So is this a family recipe? Basically, my mum used to make this uh, when, I was a, when I was a boy, and it was one of my favourite times. My auntie, who also passed away of cancer, unfortunately, um, my, my mum's sister, uh, she was a, an amazing cook. So a shout out to my cousins Anita and Leah in Sydney and, their, um, and Anita's beautiful family. She used to make these all the time. And my brother, God bless him, used to call them Piccadilly Buns, because one of the shops that my um, cousin had was in uh, Piccadilly Arcade in Sydney. And my brother could eat Piccadilly Buns like there is no tomorrow. One of the things that I love about going to Sicily is obviously, uh, if you, if you uh, for instance, cassata ice cream. A cassata means cake. So a cassata ice cream will completely change from every village. Every village will have their own cassata. Um, and, and even the various recipes, whether it's uh, pasta al forno or whether it's arancini, um, it, it it's very much will reflect uh, the recipes that have been passed down in that particular part of the world. So in Italy, when you see a restaurant called an osteria, that's generally a restaurant where the food that's being cooked only gets cooked in that square kilometre. Well, that was the traditional way it is, and now it's, it's a lot more touristy, but in the old days, if you ate at an osteria in a particular quarter of Venice, you can guarantee that you were eating something that was pretty specific to that part of Venice and no other part of Venice. And, and you can still go off the beaten track and find those osterias, um, and, and, and they will be family recipes that get passed down uh, from year to year, and, and I don't think they get written. Um, this, this recipe here is not written anywhere in my family, but we just know it because you know, we, you know, I watched mum, mum would have watched her mum, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so a bit of cracked pepper. All 
All right, salt. Sicilians are very well known for their avarice. Uh, they would rather part with their children than part with money, or so I'm told, and they love their children. So the rule of thumb in, in, in my house is always, if I'm providing the drinks, I put a little bit less salt because I don't want them to drink me out of, um, out of uh, my house. But if the drinks are being sold, then I go nuts with the salt, especially if I'm selling them. Okay, ready to go. This is the bit that might be a bit tricky, but I'm sure you'll all get it. And it doesn't have to be neat. All right, so we need to gradually take this off and gradually roll. Do uh, different people cook it with a thicker dough or is it usually just the same? Uh, I've known some people who do a, a top layer and a bottom layer, yep. right? Um, but, but we never did. So I cut, cut, squeeze or twist, and put a little gap in there. Next one, cut, squeeze, and twist. Okay, into a very hot oven for about 40 minutes or until they're golden brown on the outside. We've got a, uh, a pizza, a wood-fired pizza oven at home and clearly not 40 minutes in there because it's hundreds of degrees, but generally about a hot oven, 240 degrees Celsius. It's in the oven now. We're gonna give it about 40 minutes and hopefully we'll, in the meantime, we'll make the second um, lot of mulliate. We'll make these ones vegetarian only and hopefully um, they will look and taste spectacular. Okay, Harry, you reckon you do this one all on your own? Yep. Okay, so The apprentice has outdone the master. That's one of the best roulade rolls I've ever seen. Well done. Thank you, sir. Let's yep. that one over. Yep. So slice off about, yep, about right. that much. Yep, pull it off. Yep, then give it a twist. One hand one way, one hand the other. That's it. That's it. And then try and put a little hole in the, in the top. Okay. Yep, and then onto the, onto the, Perfect. You've shone today. Thank you, sir. But without diminishing your fine skills, it's not rocket science, okay? And nor should cooking be rocket science. If cooking becomes an effort, I think, you know, defeats should be a social activity, an activity of creativity. One of the beautiful things that Miss Kalani's brought to this college is that boys come up here now and, they, and they, they experiment, they love it. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it yeah. because they put themselves into their cooking. So I know when she's been doing, you probably make a big one out of it, when she's been doing, um, uh, and she sends me down plenty of, uh, of um, uh, samples, but for instance, when she's been doing uh, muffins, She'll yeah. let the boys, she'll teach the boys about the, the you know, the, the actual, um, you know, chemistry of, of, the, of the muffin and cooking, etc. But then she says, what kind of muffin do you want to make? What kind of muffin do you want to make? So when the boys bring them down to me, they've actually put themselves into the it's their own cooking. Own it's design. their own, it's their own. And that's, it's fantastic how much more joy you derive when what you're about to eat is reflective of you so, and your character. Yeah. So they are perfect, they're even better than mine. We are a very inclusive community, yep. so we're making those ones here for 
the meat eaters, and these ones here for the vegetarians. Because cooking nowadays is very important that, um, that you take into consideration everyone's dietary requirements. Yeah. Okay, how are we going over here? Now what you do when you take them out, you always let them sit for about 10 minutes. So they'll keep cooking a bit, and it's always good to let bread or anything like that rest. So, um, here are our umbiliate siciliani, made uh, with love, here at CBC. And I really hope, uh, I hope you really have a, a crack at it. Obviously, uh, the aroma and the taste won't be able to be um, shown to you in this video, but in a moment we're going to cut them up and if you see the looks on people's faces, that should tell a story. So, here we go. Ready? For a try? Let's go. Mm. Hollywood. Hope you've enjoyed it. Shouldn't speak with my mouth full, but I will. Have a, have a crack. Let me know how you go. Whatever you do, don't burn the house down. Thanks for joining us today. I love you all. Bye from CBC Fremantle.